Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today is uh, day 14 of the uh, ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. And we have a lot to cover today, and we'll just uh, go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, we continue to see the Russians uh, posturing and position uh, its forces uh, both to the west of the Dnieper River in a, a route of advance that, again, that would look to encircle uh, the west side of uh, Kiev. At the same time, we continue to see forces uh, of the Russian Federation uh, uh, continuing to shore up its advances that it, it has made uh, on the eastern bank of the uh, Dnieper River as, as well. So again, there has not been a lot of movement uh, that you can physically see uh, on the map of the uh, of the ongoing conflict, uh, but again, uh, the initial operations by the Russians were on a very very uh, broad front, uh, hundreds of kilometers in distance, uh, going all the way from Crimea, uh, circling all the way around to the uh, eastern separatist areas, uh, operations near Kharkiv, Kharkov. And then, and then all the way back towards the area of operations uh, near Sumy, and then further to the west, obviously, is, is Kiev. So again, it's a, it's a broad frontal uh, area of operations that, uh, that the Russians uh, continue uh, to uh, advance and, and at the same time uh, are struggling. Uh, in terms of the uh, the intense op opposition that uh, the Ukrainians are are providing, uh, a lot of what's happening uh, on the ground in terms of uh, the uh, the perceived uh, Russian weaknesses and some of these uh, these battlefield defeats that obviously uh, in terms of convoys uh, uh, coming under attack and ambushed uh, by the Ukrainians. Uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, some of this Western equip equipment uh, that has been provided to the Ukrainians, namely uh, the uh, Javelin, but also uh, a, a, a new uh, uh, a partner in this fight for the Ukrainians uh, is the uh, Inlaw, the uh, next generation light anti-tank weapon system that, while not guided, uh, is pr provi it's proving to be a very, very effective system uh, against the Russians. Uh, even though, again, that it is not guided, it does have a fairly good uh, Trijicon optic uh, that is on the weapon system that, that gives you a, uh, a 2.5 uh, magnification, and it's very accurate. When you, when you put that, uh, that crosshair or that arrow uh, on the target, and if it's within 25 to about 600 meters, maybe a little more, that missile is going to go to that target. And then, furthermore, if that target is is moving at a fairly steady speed on a on a road or or over land, uh, if the uh, operator of the in law uh, induces the uh, lead mechanism within the uh, in law. Uh, it also uh, is able to uh, induce lead and then effectively strike a moving target as well with a high degree of ac accuracy. Uh, it has a magnetic, magnetic sensor uh, in the warhead, uh, so when it is uh, flying over in a, in a top attack mode, uh, which you would use for a tank, or you could even use that for, for an APC obviously as well, uh, but as it flies over that target, it's automatically going to detonate once once the uh, the warhead detects the uh, the metal uh, within the uh, target that it is attacking, but they are proving to be uh, very accurate weapon systems that are being deployed uh, from the various rooftops uh, of these uh, built-up uh, urban areas. And again, uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, of activity and action and fighting taking place along the roadways. And uh, the Ukrainian anti-tank weapons teams, and uh, again, these aren't just good for going after tanks. It could be uh, really anything uh, that they're they're being aimed at uh, that uh, they're effectively destroying. And uh, as we know, uh, the British have delivered 2,000 of these uh, 
uh, next generation light anti-tank weapon systems to the Ukrainians with a further 1,600 more uh, on the way. Uh, so by the time this is uh, all said and done, uh, the, the Ukrainians will have close to uh, 4,000 of these uh, in-laws uh, in their arsenal actively fighting against the uh, Russians. And then on top of that, you have the ja javelins, which have a much more of an extended range than the in-laws reaching out to 3,000 meters, uh, which are fire and forget and fully guided, unlike the in-laws. But uh, again, uh, these types of systems are, are proving to be uh, very, very worrisome for the uh, Russian military. And uh, the, the uh, Ukrainians also have their own domestic versions, their own uh, Soviet and kind of copies of Russian versions of anti-tank guided weapon systems. We've seen videos of, uh, of the even uh, Ukrainian teams uh, utilizing old uh, RPG-7 types of systems and uh, using those systems very, very effectively against uh, a Russian advanced units. But uh, again, uh, the, uh, I, I would imagine that the, the Russians had to anticipate uh, the, uh, the level of uh, resistance that they could end up facing. But again, you know, no, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And uh, unfortunately for the Russians, the Ukrainians are proving to be a very, very tenacious uh, adversary. And uh, they are continuing to fight. They are a very motivated force. Uh, that is, uh, is that is not lying down. Uh, I believe that in the early stages of this con conflict, the Russians may have been hoping for, in a in a in a best uh, sort of outcome, that uh, their initial uh, strikes into Ukraine with some of those special operations and VDV forces, uh, seeking to quickly bring down the uh, Ukrainian government, would have that desired effect. But unfortunately for the Russians, that has not occurred. And now, uh, in order for the Russians to win this conflict, uh, they're going to have to slug it out in a very conventional manner, uh, the likes of which they are, they are doing now. And again, it's not going to be pretty. And uh, we're going to see a lot of, uh, of, of uh, video, and we're going to hear a lot of things that uh, are simply the nature of war. Uh, I uh, just saw another... Uh, uh, media uh, footage or report uh, indicating that the Russians are purposely targeting babies. Now, again, I, it's, this is just the horrendous reporting of, of the mainstream media that is really looking to agitate and, uh, and, and really motivate uh, the American populace against uh, the, uh, the, the Russian uh, uh, side of this. And uh, it's, it's proving, uh, quite honestly, to be very, very effective in terms of that messaging that is coming out of, uh, of the media. Uh, are there, uh, is war brutal? Yes, it, it absolutely is, and especially the type of war that we're, uh, we're seeing now, in which uh, we're, we're seeing uh, large conventional uh, armies with with heavy artillery and multiple launch rocket systems and multi-role fighter aircraft bombing and fighting uh, very close to a civilian population centers. And again, uh, unfortunately, the Ukrainian military uh, has decided to uh, use the cities, these uh, very large population centers, as a defensive redoubts against the uh, Russian military. And of course, the Russians are going to strike back and they're going to use uh, all, all available assets at their disposal uh, to uh, engage the, uh, the Ukrainian military that they are fighting. So inherently, we are going to see uh, civilian targets uh, get hit, unfortunately. And it's just the nature of war. We, 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 we observed that in uh, World War II. We've seen it in the Korean War. We, we've seen it throughout the ages of modern warfare in which uh, uh, humans started to fight near cities and in uh, major cities. Remember, uh, the United States 
uh, firebombed uh, Dresden and, and, a, and a multitude of both German uh, and Japanese cities. Uh, again, uh, the, the U.S. And, and the Allies were, were launching uh, massive uh, air raids with a, a, a thousand bombers at, at, in some times against targets in Germany and Japan in which we firebombed entire, uh, entire cities because uh, those cities uh, had military, uh, uh, industrial uh, uh, industry uh, in those in those cities, and they had to be hit. And that's kind of what we're uh, what we're seeing as well within the confines of this this war, but but more or less more of a direct uh, military to military uh, engagement. I, I don't believe the Russians are just attacking civilian targets to attack civilian targets. I think, again, if, if, we, if that was actually occurring, we would see the Russians uh, carpet bombing Kiev. And we haven't seen that yet. We've seen individual strikes that have happened to hit civilian targets that have been possibly close to military targets or military targets uh, operating within those civilian uh, targets as well. So again, uh, that's just the, uh, I, I would say, the, the, the way the, the media reports it, and it's, it, it tends to exaggerate things, and uh, that's exactly what they're doing. But right now, the Russians are really going to have to find a way to uh, regain uh, some sort of, uh, of initiative uh, in this fight. It would seem right now they are preparing uh, for what could be a very, very large operation uh, uh, near Kiev. Uh, we continue uh, to see uh, preparatory work underway by the Russians, and I think the Russians now know that they are, they are really uh, in a fight and are, are going to need to bring the full weight of their, of their military uh, and industrial apparatus uh, down upon uh, the Ukrainians. Uh, in order to uh, win this, if that's their their objective, and uh, again, it's not going to be pretty to see that. Uh, we're starting to see, the, in some cases, uh, the Ukrainians uh, counterattack and uh, launch operations. Uh, a good example would be a recent operation, very re near recent operation within the last 48 or so hours, near uh, Kharkiv. Uh, in which a, a Ukrainian unit uh, pressed very close, counterattacked, and pressed very, very close to the uh, Russian border. In fact, we know that at least two battalion tactical groups of the Russian military that was operating to the uh, uh, north-northwest of Kharkiv were reportedly moved back to Belgorod, uh, and that was reported that that those two battalion tactical groups were were being sent back to uh, refit. In all likelihood, I would say they are adjusting some of their forces to meet that counterattack uh, by the Ukrainians that uh, that occurred to the uh, south uh, east of uh, Kharkiv. And uh, again, the Ukrainians continue to operate now uh, within the confines of that area as well. And we can expect the uh, obviously the Russians to uh, attempt to counter that and push those forces back at some point. And uh, again, that will probably be with the use of uh, of heavy artillery uh, and uh, those uh, both fixed wing and uh, helicopter and uh, multiple launch rocket systems uh, within the course of uh, of uh, that battle. We could we could see take place. Uh, in other areas, uh, we have heard about a Russian advance on uh, uh, Zaporizhia. It's estimated that about four battalion tactical groups of the Russian military are pushing forward towards Zaporizhia uh, within this area. Again, that would be about 3,000 troops and maybe two uh, to 300 uh, armored vehicles and uh, other vehicles. Uh, that would be involved in that offensive. Uh, definitely not enough to, uh, to take the city, quite possibly just enough to seal the city off from the uh, eastern approaches to the city. But again, the Russians are going to have to eventually uh, reduce uh, uh, the uh, opposition within Mariupol. Uh, there's reported at least four battalion tactical groups uh, operating uh, near Mariupol, attempting to force its way into the city now, and eventually 
uh, if and when uh, Mariupol is it capitulates, then obviously we would see a, those forces then continue to move and assist with the uh, the general advance uh, to the uh, to the north and along uh, eventually uh, what could possibly uh, be a, a hookup, uh, a merging of forces with the Kharkov front and the uh, Odessa front down here in the south. Uh, again, we keep hearing about the possibility of a, uh, a Russian operation towards Odessa. I think we're, we're a bit off from that. Uh, again, I think uh, there's going to have to be a significant amount of consolidation and uh, the capture of additional territory and bridgehead, bridgeheads over uh, this, uh, this river here uh, that runs from uh, Mikolaev uh, north. And uh, again, I don't think we're, we're close to seeing uh, that sort of Russian success as of yet. I think a lot of this area is going to have to be captured, uh, quite possibly uh, seal, completely sealing off uh, Mikolaev, if not capturing uh, Mikolaev. If not, the uh, Russians are going to have to go much further to the north and then come down and engage Odessa from the uh, north-northeast and then possibly uh, conduct an amphibious operation. But I think we're, we're probably quite a ways off uh, from that happening. Uh, I, I know some of the uh, analytical sites had, had, has estimated within 48, 72 hours. I, I would wager we're, we're probably a good uh, two weeks before the Russians uh, are able to make a direct assault or even start to approach and seal off Odessa, the way things are, are going right now, and it's going to be a, 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 again a lengthy fight uh, for the Russians uh, uh, in this in this ongoing operation, uh, as I had anticipated. I, again, I did not think that this was going to be a, a very quick operation. I again said before when this operation kicked off that there's no way the Russians are taking Kiev in 72 hours, and again I, I would say at least. 30 days. If, if, in fact, the Russians do decide to completely seal it off and uh, actually attack Kiev, again, this is going to take take some time. And uh, now we're continuing to hear about uh, additional weapon systems that will be sent to Ukraine. Uh, we're now hearing that the uh, the uh, British will uh, send the uh, Star Streak weapon system to Ukraine. That is predominantly an air defense system. It is a guided air defense system, but with that being said, it is also able to effectively attack ground targets. In fact, uh, side aspect shots on the hull of, of main battle tanks with the star streak would disable a uh, a main battle tank, especially if it hits in, hits the engine compartment area. It's going to immobilize the tank, and uh, if it uh, if the star streak is used against BMP threes, BMP twos, BMP ones, BTRs, I mean th they would destroy those vehicles uh, outright. And again, it is a uh, a, a guided weapon system. Uh, the pr principle of that weapon we weapon system is that it utilizes three explosive darts, and again, uh, it it can be very effective against en engaging uh, helicopters. And uh, again. Uh, in all likelihood, I think the Star Streak will really find its own against uh, actual ground targets that the uh, Ukrainians could could engage from some great distances, especially with the tactics the Ukrainians are using right now. Uh, they're using the rooftops of a lot of these buildings. They're hiding on rooftops, uh, in forests, in fields, and then popping up with these uh, anti-tank weapon systems, Stinger missiles. And uh, we, we saw one video recently where a, uh, possibly a stinger was used or a, a Russian-made uh, uh, guided weapon was, was used against a hind. But uh, that uh, is uh, what, what's kind of happening on the ground is going to continue to happen on the ground, and it's probably going to bring a lot of retribution uh, by the Russians uh, as they continue to take losses and continue to fight uh, this very, very determined uh, Ukrainian uh, military now will at some point will just the sheer weight of the uh, of the Russian military just kind of at some point overwhelm the Ukrainians I think that's what the Russians are anticipating uh, obviously the Ukrainians are taking casualties the Russians continue to hit targets with cruise missiles and 
and use, utilizing their tactical aircraft to, to bomb targets and they're using their uh, artillery and, and multiple launch rocket systems uh, it, it, as well. And the Ukrainians are taking, taking casualties as well, probably just as many as the Russians, quite frankly, uh, given the, uh, the intensity of some of the, the fighting that is occurring. But uh, that's where we stand right now. We anticipate that the Russians will try again to uh, regain some sort of initiative here in the near future, especially uh, in the area in the supporting operations uh, near Kiev. They're going to have to do something uh, right now, uh, both politically and uh, militarily, to kind of regain initiative uh, as, as right now, at least in the West, uh, many people just turning on the TV would believe that the uh, uh, the Ukrainians may in fact be winning this. Now, that that's probably not the truth. And again, the the Ukrainians are are taking great casualties in this as well. And I guess the question is 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 just how long can the Ukrainians hold out? And uh, at what point uh, do, do the Russians really kind of start taking the gloves off? And, uh, and using some of that Russian doctrine that we just haven't really seen yet. And I think we could, we could quite possibly see that here in the, in the near future. But uh, we'll continue to monitor and report and bring you uh, as much information as we can. Have a good day, everybody.